Yeah, absolutely. And look, again, I, you know, people need to read this document because I think the more eyes that are on it, the more things will pick up. Certainly the first thing that, that I want to mention is Lee Tran is the Professor of International Education at Deakin University and you know, well known throughout the industry. Picked up that the eligible age for a temporary graduate visa will be reduced from 50 to 35. Now I think this one's a really, really fascinating one. The age obviously and again when you think about comments that have been thrown around there's there was a comment earlier around you know that the best migrant to australia you know studies offshore comes on shore does a little a little bit of study and then they pay tax for 40 years so there, there, there's certainly an element of return on investment in this and if we're moving from 50 to 35 i think that underscores that point i probably won't labor it but it's a significant shift and i'm not sure that it's necessarily the best one i think you know if we're looking at phd candidates that that age probably needs to be lifted a little bit Hi, my name's Dirk Mulder. I'm the founder of The Quality News. I'm coming to you from Perth, Western Australia. And g'day, I'm Rob Malicki, coming to you from the opposite side of the world, the dark and the grey of the Parisian winter, where I'm holed up for the winter with my in-laws. Our last podcast for the year, Dirk. It's it been sure a is. a fun couple of months, hasn't it, getting into it has. the Global Horizons? It has. It's been great. I mean, the feedback's been, been terrific. It's been, you know, most people I've spoken to have actually talked about it. So it's been, it's been really good. And talk about a Christmas gift just before we knock off for holidays. Could the government have timed it any better? I feel like you and I, <laughs> for the last couple of months, <laughs> have spent most of our time talking about reviews. It, we sure have. But a huge one touched down this week, the migration review long awaited. God, there is so much to unpack in here, isn't there? Mate, it's a big box with a big bow on it. Let's just hope it's not one of those boxes within boxes within boxes. So you, as you unwrap the outer box, you pull out the inner box and so on and so forth. But this one could keep given for, for quite some time because there's, while the review's been handed down, there is certainly still a lot of, I don't want to say unanswered questions, but there still seems to be a lot of work to be done before it's all finalised. So it'll be an interesting sort of Q1, Q2 of next year as well, I think. I definitely agree with you on that. Looking at some of the timelines that are proposed in in the documentation, like, wow, some of this stuff is pretty tight in terms of timelines. So let's get into the details. And firstly, mate, thank you so much for distilling so much of it down in the Koala News. That has been an incredibly helpful starting point. But I don't know where I would have started with this thing without you. So yeah, note of gratitude on that one. Oh, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. And ironically, I mean, when I first got the copy of the embargoed review, I kind of thought the same thing. And it took me a couple of hours even just to kind of think about structure. You know, you probably know this in the in the hand down of the review, there's actually three documents. So there's the main document, which is a hundred pages cover to cover. There's an action plan of five pages and there's an added glance document as well. So and I think that's about three pages. And realistically, the structure of it all, I think I actually kind of worked backwards. I, I looked at the action plan and thought, what are the new initiatives that we need to be looking at? What, what's the government been doing? And then how do we kind of put some meat on the bone around that to make sure that people out there actually understand what's being proposed and what the, what the rationale or the context is for that? So yeah, certainly the, the first one was really just a, a real factual kind of summary of, of what's been going on. Well, let's get into some of the details. Maybe can we start with just a really brief summary for those people working in international ed. What are the key things that they need to know out of this mega review? Let's start right at the pinnacle here. It is, it's a mega review. Migration review has been promised now pretty much since the Labor government got in into power uh, a couple of years back. It started, I believe, in September of last, last year, the year before. Parkinson and co provided the review, which is handed down in March of this year. And this essentially, I guess, is the government response to that. So at the top level, there's eight... I guess, key areas of transformation of which international education has one of them, and we'll get to that. But I might just, if it's okay, I might just run run you down because it's it's quite the breadth of, of the migration review. So the first one's around targeting temporary skilled migration to address the skills and needs and promote worker mobility. Obviously, fairly clear to key to any migration strategy. Second is reshaping permanent skilled migration to drive long-term prosperity. And, you know, when we talk about permanent skilled migration, it's a little bit different to temporary. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that shifts across that. The third one's directly focused at at our space, at international education. And the title they've given it is Strengthening the Integrity and Quality of International Education. They're those those buzzwords again. And it's a package of integrity measures to lift the standards for international students and education providers while ensuring graduates help meet skills shortages and do not become permanent temporary. And I think we'll get we'll get into that in a lot more detail. I quite like that that expression, permanent temporariness. Yeah, it's really <laughs> it feels like a new addition to the Oxford Dictionary for 2023. Mate, it's, it's really interesting because Julian Hill spoke at, at the Simplead conference last week in Sydney, and this was a really big focus of his talk, that permanent temporary. And I guess his view and the Labor government's view is that 
the previous government, the Morrison government, put a lot, I guess, went to the public and said, you know, we're not increasing permanent migration. We're not increasing permanent migration. But there are, you know, a lot, a lot of people who have been moving from bridge, from visa to visa without really the hope of permanent migration, or I shouldn't say not, not necessarily the hope, but they're sitting back waiting for government policy to change so they can move into that permanent area. So there's a lot of people that are sitting around and have been for, you know, between five and 10 years on temporary migrant visas with the view of potentially staying in Australia, but just not quite being able to find the avenue to get that permanency. Absolutely. Mm. Let's move on. Number four. No worries. Tackling worker exploitation and the misuse of the visa system. So again, as a, around integrity, planning migration to get the right skills in the right places. And I think that's, again, a really important point that we'll pick up on in a little bit. Tailoring regional visas and working holiday maker program. And there's been quite a bit of backlash on this from tourism lobbies around they're cutting back working holiday visas from two years to one year. And there's, yeah, it's been, particularly over here in Western Australia, where, you know, the, the majority of backpackers will actually enter through the East Coast, and they'll end up in, in WA in that second year. So there's actually quite a bit of concern around that. So number seven is deepening our people-to-people -people ties in the Indo-Pacific. And eight is simplifying the migration system to improve the experience for migrants and employers. So again, really wide, a really wide a ride scope there. Where would you like to dive in? Well, mate, look, from our point of view, I, I guess we, we need to look at international students and, and where, we're, where, where we're heading for that. So again, there's eight sub points within the international student area. And the first is around being introduced to a set of measures to improve integrity within the national education and support genuine students. We've seen a lot of work in this already. And, and in the in the action plan, this is actually listed as, a, as an existing commitment and, and an ongoing way. Strengthening of ASCOR and some of the, the money that was put around being able to strengthen the, the integrity measures that's been an ongoing initiative for the last few months. So it'll be interesting to see again how that develops further as we look at some of these other streams. And really, I mean, from a high level, you know, the government's really gone hard on this integrity. And, you know, if you're watching the media, you seem to think that there's a lot there's a lot of shocks out there, a lot of shocks, a lot of students rotting the system. And I wouldn't necessarily say that, that that's the case. And certainly, certainly when Brendan O'Connor was asked the question back when he did his National Press Club talk, his answer to that question was really interesting. He got asked earlier in the morning by Patricia Cavellis on, on AM, I think it was, or, or breakfast uh, on the ABC, and he didn't really have a response. And later that day, he he answered between uh, probably a, a few more than a dozen. More than 12 and less than 100. More than 12, <laughs> less less than 100. So when we talk about integrity and when we talk about unscrupulous behaviour and we talk about these things, I think we need to put it in the context of the broader system and, and how large that is. So certainly, again, I mean, nobody would question the government for saying that we do need to rein in shonky behaviour and the student is the centre of what we do. But I think when we put it in context of the system, it's probably, I don't know, I just, I just get this feeling that it's not as bad as what everyone says it is. The overlap between the international ed slash tourism review and mm. migration in this recommendation, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that picks up on it again. So yeah, it'll, anyway, let's move, let's motor on and then I think we can yeah, probably have a, have a general discussion at the end and, and tie some of these things together. This next one's a big one. The changes to English language requirements. Talk us through those. Yeah, look, it really is. I mean, it's, I struggle to comprehend this one, if I can put it, if I can say that. I don't know of any data that exists that actually purports or underpins this recommendation, or now I guess this this implementation strategy of, of raising students in English language to meet a visa requirement. The only bit of data that I can see in terms of student success around English was uh, in a report that Alan Olson did some time ago, and it concluded or it, it, it proposed that international students actually complete their courses in a much more, in a quicker, or a, I shouldn't say quicker, but certainly in a much more purported way than what domestic students do. So if English language was a real issue, I wouldn't imagine that that would be the case. So yeah, I, I really struggle with this one. I get the feeling that this might have been come out of either a business lobby or a union lobby where there are people talking about, well, you know, the graduates we get, they can't talk English. And again, it's that anecdotal stuff that we're constantly pushing back on within the international education sector around English around English, and around students' ability in the English area. But again, I find it really difficult because there's just, there's no data that supports it. Yeah, and quite significant increases. I mean, on the IELTS testing system, basically raising everything by half a point. So for temporary graduate visas, increasing it from 6.0 to 6.5, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, everything going up essentially by by half a point, which, you know, can make a massive difference to a student who, who, who might be, you know, good enough at the moment on the current system to get straight in, you know, direct entry into a degree, but under a new regime is now going to go, have to spend a big chunk of extra money and a big chunk of extra time to 
get up from six to six point five in order to to commence a degree, that starts to sound like what could be a significant roadblock to a lot of students, to me. Yeah, look, and I think you know, it, there's a couple of different things in the in this. So I think what we need to be a little bit careful of in, is in terms of universities' entry English, and they're obviously self accrediting institutions, so they can kind of set if there's no professional qualification at the end of it, and there's no professional body that 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 dictates what they need to come out at or what they even need to start at. So say, for instance, nursing uh, has a much higher IELTS requirement because students uh, who might come into a graduate nursing program will be out on placement straight away. So they might be asking for a 7.0 or, 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 or else. But for the average undergraduate degree, you're probably going to be expecting 6.0 and that's not changing. What these changes bring into effect is that to obtain that visa, you're actually requiring that higher thing. So they're bringing the English language requirement up in line. In terms of packages, that's really the question now in terms of how how are we going to start structuring packages and will students come? For those that may be affected, there may be an outcome now where a student will need to come into Australia on an English visa and do their English first and then apply for their program after that. And we'll get into that because there's another roadblock a little bit further down around that genuine student test where they're now talking about pushing I guess, the emphasis to offshore visa applications rather than onshore. So again, will that be a, a, a roadblock for someone who's onshore, not trying to game the system, but who may, you know, require extra English support up front? I don't know if that's, again, that's a, one of those pits where we still need to we still need to look at. Next recommendation here or next point that they're going to be implementing is applying greater and more targeted scrutiny to student visa applications from high risk providers. Maybe before we get into the details, can you help us out with what a high risk provider is? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, obviously the Department of Home Affairs has you know, some data in the background there that looks at, at students and looks at which providers that they're going to attend and looks for trend data across that. That's probably a little bit more clear cut when you start talking about universities and the most the easiest area of that is the simplified visa processing, or the simple, simplified visa framework, where universities are actually ranked according to their student profile with the Department of Home Affairs. So if a student, you know, is is denied a visa, if a student comes on shore and leaves within the first six months, if they're given a release, all of those things count towards what a trusted sort of provider is or, or a preferred provider versus one who might not be. Now, I would imagine that the Department of Home Affairs has that sort of data on most providers and they're wanting to extend that into the agent space as well. So I guess triangulating, you know, where are students coming from, who are they seeing before they arrive and where are they going to study and then being able to look at that in a way that actually puts providers into into a level and then they'll be, I guess, assessed based on, on their levels and, and the attention given towards that. There will be, I mean, within this, there is a ministerial announcement or direction that's going to come out fairly shortly. My understanding is it's it's due before the end of the year. So watch out next week, which will provide some more detail around all, the, all of this. And I guess that sort of visa question flows through to how student visas are being processed. So it looks like there's some extra funding in here for, for the Department of Home Affairs and Immigration to maybe do this a little bit better? Yeah, absolutely. So 19 million has been has been allocated to the Pulse to the Student Visa Integrity Unit. My understanding is that that will go directly towards increased staff levels. And again, so when we start talking about service levels against level one providers, level two providers, level three providers, that extra staffing will be able to cope or be able to, to support those service level agreements around those areas. So on one hand, if you're a good provider, level one, you've now got I don't want to say guarantee because I don't think there's any guarantees even with service level agreements, but there's certainly a view that that your visas will be turned around a lot quicker and that $19 will go a long way towards that, hopefully. Yeah, that's good news. The next action item is one that we also saw in the the International Ed slash Tourism Review, which is around... I guess the the scrupulousness <laughs> of, no, of, absolutely. of the people people working inside international education. I wasn't surprised to see this one in here. I think this this uh, particular point just speaks to the fact that, as you said earlier in the conversation, you know they're trying to make it harder for the shonks to operate in this space, so that the industry can continue to to contribute to the economy and to national culture in such a significant way without having that sort of darker side, which I think the media tends to like to hone in on. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So strengthening the requirements for international education providers, making sure that people have the fit and proper test, that we've got the right people running providers and, and that they're doing the right things. I mean, I guess from this point of view, I mean, you can talk about strengthening them. It'll be interesting to see what 
actually comes out about strengthening. I would imagine that that both Texra and, and Asqua have the powers at the moment now to be able to, to do these sorts of things. Maybe they need to be expanded a little bit, but to, yeah, I mean, I would imagine if, if somebody knows... The example I gave the other day is, you know, if a journalist can walk into a ghost college on Queen Street in Melbourne and say, where are your students? There, I don't think there's anything presenting, there's anything stopping Asqua or Texa from doing exactly the same thing and then being able to slap something on them. And I think that's the kind of thing that we, we as, a, as a sector, we want to see. We, you know, we don't want to be seeing ghost colleges operating. We don't want to be seeing, you know, shonky people operating in a way where students are coming into the country and working. It's why the sector pushed back on on no on on capping on non having capped work rights. Students should be here to study first, and 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 I think. It's a, it's a very fair point. We did talk about this when we had our conversation about the International Ed and Tourism Review and to what extent it's going to be possible to make meaningful change in this space because for those people who run a business, you, you know it's fairly straightforward in order to change the people who are director, a director of an organisation. So we sort of talked about the facts that, you know, if a owner then, you know, redirects a directorship to their cousin or their neighbour or somebody else down down the street, how government is going to actively police that is is going to be really interesting to see. And I guess there's going to be a, a lot more to keep an eye out for in the detail of this once they get to implementing it. No, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I, I think watching a current affair would be would be a good thing. That's probably the first place it's going to hit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, just speaking on that, like what a great thing to have a free independent media. I, absolutely. I just, I marvel at this day in, day out, how lucky we are in this country just to have journalists who fearlessly go out and put their own reputations on the line. They, th- these organisations put their money where their mouth is, you know, backing up against massive defamation cases in order to represent the public interest. We're just so lucky in this country. So there we go. That's my little bit of Christmas cheer. Thank you. Thank you to all the journalists out there. Right. No, mate, you're absolutely right. I mean, in Canada, they actually have a show called The Fifth Estate, which literally says we are the fifth estate. We're, we're like the, another independent voice that's looking at, you know, how society operates. And, and you say, you're absolutely right. It, um, we are very lucky. I think at times we take that for granted. Um, and I think for those of us that have been lucky enough to travel to countries where that's not the case, you, it's a little bit more in your face than, than you know, if you, if you haven't had that opportunity. Now, next point of implementation is getting to our permanent temporariness, which I'm so excited about, (laughs) which is around visa hopping onshore. And this was pointed out quite clearly in the International Ed Review as well. But here we have some some action steps very clearly specified to how they're hoping to to, to shut down on this. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe before we even I mention the action steps, Julian Hill again at at Simpler last week spoke really well on this point. You know, if you start at the point where you know it's, it's not possible for Australia to offer every student that studies here a path to permanent migration, and that's just a true fact. Yeah, the numbers are too large, so he, he's absolutely bang on about that. What I think we forget is is what is the proposition of international education. So the proposition is coming to a safe, high-quality education place that's cost-effective, that has opportunities to work while you study, that has opportunities to potentially engage with the country post that, whether they be short-term or in a migratory pattern. So that's really the matrix at which the students look through uh, a destination at. When we start talking about about visa hopping, that's a culture that's developed. And in my view, that culture is developed by the government. And I say that, and I'll explain this in, in, in more detail. The government for a very long time wants to be able to control the flow of migration. So they turn the tap off, they turn the tap back on, and they turn the tap off and they turn it back on again. And, and we're going through clearly a, 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 a stage now where that tap is slowly being turned off again for a period of time until we need it back on again. Now, so long as that culture prevails, what is going to be the the subsequent culture or the opposite culture of a student wanting to try and stay in this country? And it might be because of love. It might be because they love the country. It might be because they do generally have a better standard of living here and they see themselves here. It might be because they they literally, they want to call Australia home, but they're not able to. So while the government turns off and turns off, turns on and turns off, Students will visa hop because they want to try and stay here until such time as that tap gets turned on in a way that benefits them to access a permanent a permanent step. So if I think back over the last ten years, you know we had pretty much anyone studied who studied a master's degree was able to attract to permanent residency, and that was in the early days. Then we kind of turned that off and we went to a skilled migration route, and we had the chefs and the cooks and the 
and the and the mechanics and the this and the accountants hairdressers uh, and and none of no, I shouldn't say none of them but this is my my pet peeve all of this all of this skilled migration discussion uh, goes on the on the premise that kids or people who study skilled occupations should end up in those jobs. And if they do, and if that system works, over a period of two or three years, we should see a significant decline in the skilled on demand list vacancies than what previously happened, because that's how the system should be designed. What we find is that students for the last, how long have we been in, in, in this business? 15, 20 years? Yep. Yeah, Accounting has pretty much been on that list the entire time. Now, if we haven't graduated enough accountants by now, I do not know what's going on. So it comes down to this culture of people are studying accounting to become migrants, but they're not actually accountants now. And that's where the problem exists. So we need to we need to close that nexus of being able to get people into those skilled migra- into those skilled jobs and be able to st- have them stick there. And if we're not doing that, then this whole system is undermined right from right from day one. Yeah, you don't need to go very far. Down, down the main street of Manly in Sydney to, to find a backpacker who has already transitioned onto a student visa to learn some English and then is looking to do something else and basically really wants to stay in Australia because let's face it, we've got a great life here. We're so fortunate. It's a really challenging area for government. I, I, I'm curious to see how this evolves in the next next 12 to 24 months because literally if there's a way around students and, and other people will find a way around because if they want to stay here, they'll, they'll find, find the route. And I think more importantly as well is that there will always be professionals, put that in inverted commas, who are looking at the system with a mind to helping people get around the rules, if that makes sense. So going to be a real challenge for government. No, mate, absolutely. And, and you, you raise a really, a really valid point. So this is a significant shift in Australian government policy. The last government was very clear about, particularly through COVID, but even before COVID, around students filling low-skilled jobs. And and when I say low-skilled, somebody's going to bite my head off about this one, but things like baristas and bartenders and things that rely on short-term labour and in transient labour at that, and and students being able to to fill those roles. This government clearly has said, no, that's not where we're at. We want the high end of town. And, And so... From that point of view, the discussion has shifted significantly around skilled migration being based around those high end of town jobs. Now, there might be you know further discourse around, well, actually, no, 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 that's not what we meant. We still do want students to contribute to the economy. But I guess what I'm saying is as a focus, that shifted. And I think that's a, a really, a really interesting point to note between these two governments. Next point is around st- strengthening and simplifying the temporary graduate visas. Yeah, so it's, again, interesting. There's a little table in the document. I get everyone to have a look at that. There's actually, from what I can see, there's not too much change in this. From what I gather, I think there's there's one class that drops one year and then there's an option of two years on, on the back end of some of these graduate visas and that's been removed. And, and like I said, that one year option, the one year has been decreased. And I want to say it's masters by coursework has, has gone from three years to two years post-study work rights. The interesting bit in this is India's exempt. One of the things that came out, that's come out over the last 24 hours, is that because of the trade agreement between Australia and India that was signed earlier this year, there was an undertaking in that to maintain these the, the previous set of, of post-study work rights. So it's really fascinating to see India being exempt from, from this, whole, this whole move. But again, big, big in writing, I'm not sure that it's going to be as massive when it comes to the actual impact. Yeah, fascinating, isn't it? I really find this this pathway thing. I was just looking looking up a stat as you were talking because I remember hearing at a conference about the proportion of students that end up staying permanently in Australia. And I was saying sixteen percent. Yeah, it's, it's not, not great. It's not as big number. as what what the general public would think. It's not as huge. Correct, correct. I mean, you're seeing numbers in the paper at the moment: five hundred thousand people migrating permanently to Australia this year. I even just was, was talking with a neighbour down the street the other day and he was like, oh, the government's you know, lost control of the borders, 500,000 people coming in. And the question I asked him was like, okay, that's fine, but what about the business lobby, which is still screaming for staff members all across the country? What, what, what are you going to say to them if you say that you want to completely cut this this number all the way back? And I just feel like we're in this kind of post-COVID up and down situation with with numbers settling back to normal. 
Uh, absolutely. I think we discussed this a couple of podcasts ago where really it's about balancing that public perception of the of the accommodation crisis and oh my god all these all these migrants are coming in and taking our homes why is my why is my rent going up why can't i afford a house versus what is the consumption and the labor force going to do for our economy at the other end and it's it's a really interesting balancing act at the moment i think that the government it's a tight tight rope that the government's walking last point here i love the language of this of this point, which is supporting international students and graduates to realise their potential. It kind of goes back to what you were alluding to earlier in the conversation. What's the substance of, of this point, though? Look, I think there's probably a point that, again, crosses over to some of the other work that's being done in other reviews. We're talking about ensuring that those who stay are best fit for permanent migration, essentially. So we're talking about work integrated learning. We're talking about internships. Where So those people who are on tracks to, to a migration outcome are probably hopefully in a better spot to contribute to the economy etc etc who can argue with this point i think it's a brilliant one i think the government for a very long time should have or should have incentivized engagement with the labor force and particularly with work integrated learning and internships i know even when i think about my undergraduate degree oh gosh i don't even want to say how long ago that was i graduated in 96 so too long ago the truth the <laughs> truth is out absolutely but any experience any any opportunity that we had to experience work integrated learning, and I guess that's a newer term, but work experience through our course was amazing. I mean, I did, my undergraduate was actually in kind of environmental science. It was actually a bachelor's degree called social ecology. And I still remember my work experience. I did, you know, some work with Lanka Australia in Chatswood in Sydney. And it was, it was incredible to be able to get out there and, 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 and actually see that nexus between what you're learning theoretically and being able to apply it practically in an environment where, it's real. So I think anything we, we can do in this space um, is good for both domestic students and international students. I agree with that. And elsewhere in that report, I did note that in terms of uh, some of the provisions that will be put in place that allow students to hop between qualifications or add on further qualifications. So, so for example, at the moment, a student can be doing a, a Bachelor of Science and then can pretty much go on and do any other degree. Whereas there's going to be a strengthening of that where the government would like to see that there's a logical progress for students from one qualification to another. So, for example, from a, a, a bachelor's to a master. Oh, mate, be very careful applying any logic in this space. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> no, but you're right. I mean, you're absolutely right. And it comes down to, I think, what we mentioned earlier about that genuine student test and, and being really careful about what that might bring because you're right, that'll get picked up in this genuine student test. And logically, using that word again, depending on what program and how they string, how a student might string those programs together, it makes sense. But when we talk about the genuine temporary entrant test, the same applied, right? Logically, you would say that students could say certain things through that test, and they couldn't. So let's see see what drops with the with the student test and and how that's applied, and not even just applied, but applied consistently. I think that's the most important thing. If we're looking at visa officers making assessments based on you know worldviews that are very different and that logic was applied in different ways then we're still going to be in the same situation i noticed in um, one of your articles in the koala this week dirk you picked up a, on a few other strands here of interest yeah absolutely and look again i you know people need to read this document because i think the more eyes that are on it the more things will pick up certainly the first thing that that i want to mention is lee tran is the professor of international education at deakin university and you know well known throughout the industry picked up that the eligible age for a temporary graduate visa will be reduced from 50 to 35 now i think this one's a really really fascinating one the age obviously and again when you think about comments that have been thrown around there's there was a comment earlier around you know the the best migrant to australia you know, studies offshore, comes on shore, does a little a little bit of study, and then they pay tax for 40 years. So there, there, there's certainly an element of return on investment in this. And if we're moving from 50 to 35, I think that underscores that point. I probably won't labour it, but it's a significant shift, and I'm not sure that it's necessarily the best one. I think, you know, if we're looking at PhD candidates, that, um, that age probably needs to be lifted a little bit. Yeah, we risk losing some of those great people who are deeper into their careers and have more experience to other countries. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I think the government would turn around and say, well, we're doing this, you know, while we're doing this, we're actually opening up other pathways in skilled migration. So this isn't necessarily a roadblock for everyone. If you, if you then have the skills in a skilled migration context, then you just move tracks, right? You just, you're not staying this. This isn't a, an, a, a, a catch-all or a blanket-all for everyone. 
The second is uh, around grandfathering. So, and grandfathering, I guess, is a clause that you know is is used widely. One of the things that I think is really important is that there are we've got a lot of students in this country at the moment that came to Australia based on a certain proposition that was available at that time, and that includes post study work rights. It includes uh, essentially the migration settings that were there at the moment. Nishi Bora from ERI and Ravi Lohan Sin from Global Reach made some really good observations around grandfathering. Does it mean that students who are, might be studying in their first year of their undergraduate or, or the first year of their master's degree will not be able to access the proposition that was offered to them when they started? And I think it's a really important point. And certainly from my point of view, I think honouring that offer is, is really important. There's nothing worse than when you're out uh, promoting an institution and it, it's and students say to you, well, you know, is this still going to be the case when I graduate? And, and you can't put your hand on your heart and say yes or no. So I think being consistent in this manner and, and delivering on the promise that was made, even if it was from a, for, uh, a former government, is really, really important. Oh, look, just to finish, just to finish up, there's there's one point around the COVID event visa. So we've spoken, we've seen lots in the press about the government talking about closing down the loopholes that were created by the previous government. And one of those loopholes is the COVID event visa, which is the 408. The 408 essentially was established by the Liberal government to ensure that any student who was in the country and who was coming off of a student visa wouldn't be in limbo. They could go on to this COVID event visa, which would allow them essentially to see out the COVID period. And then once the COVID period was, was finished, they were able to then either return home or move on to a different visa as they as they may need to. Interesting thing, I think the Labor government's going very strong on this point about the Liberal government and, and some of the loopholes. When you look at the at the timelines of these things, it was actually the Labor government came into power. Certainly, I think it was May twenty twenty two. They pretty quickly, and I you know, when I think back, they pretty quickly started to shut down the COVID payments for Australians or for anyone in Australia, the, the health payments. And that that finished in October. It wasn't until September of the following year. I think I, I want to say it was the last COVID initiative that was actually shut down, and it was probably. 18 months, 16, 18 months after the borders opened that the COVID event visa was shut down to new applicants. So to me, I just, I, I really struggle with this one because I think well and good to say there were some loopholes, but I don't think the, the, the current government did very well. They, they could have shut down, that down a, a lot earlier. Um, ironically, they're still, grandf- well, they're still grandfathering people through that scheme and people who are on that scheme are still able to reapply for another COVID event visa up until the uh, the 1st of February, 2024. So the program isn't being shut down for those people until the 1st of February, 2024. So when we talk about people who are, you know, permanent temporary, here's a really big group of people. And, you know, I've tried to look at stats and I think it's anywhere between 100 and 150,000 people are on this visa at the moment. So, yeah, and so when we talk about, which, which then gives me the next kind of point, right, which is the government's been talking about a massive reduction in temporary permanent migrants. Well, there's 150,000 people right there that potentially in the next six months will be exiting our shores or moving into something, a different category. So when we talk about those numbers and trying to reduce them by half, 150 is going to go a long, long, a long, long way. Do you think that might just be because the capacity of home affairs to process 100 to 150,000 additional visa applications, the, the capacity just isn't there right now? And so for them at the moment, they can see that's a huge issue they need to resolve. I mean, I think most people would feel that the pandemic is was kind of over 12 to 18 months ago, but Home Affairs is just still chasing its tail, catching up, getting on top of that visa backlog. And they're just looking at that massive pile of people saying, oh God, we just don't want to touch that right now because if we do, suddenly we're going to be back underwater. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it may well be. I, I haven't heard anything about those sorts of backlogs, but it, it may well be something as simple as that. I'm not sure. I just just know from work in general, anytime you see 100 to 150,000 of anything sitting in a big pile, you're oh, like, I don't want to touch that right now. Mate, it's scale, isn't it? It's absolutely at scale. It's it's a, it's a very big pile. Anyway, but you add that up with, you know, pent-up demand. So what I mean by pent-up demand is, you know, you've had a lot of people come back after COVID into second and third year of university or into their, you know, second year of their master's or their second year of their PhD. So we've had almost like a, I don't want to say like a double entrance quota, but we've had more people coming in post-COVID that were on previous visas uh, and they're all due to, to exit the system as well over the next 12 months. So I think what we'll see is, a, a, a natural attrition from the migration program, uh, if I can put it that way, 
rather than anything that's really been constructed as such. The natural ebb and flow of the cycle, as we well know, and if only the media could sometimes just take a deep breath and let it do its thing, that would be wonderful. Mate, this has been, this has been a bumper edition. My last thing for 2023, Study Move have just released their latest analysis of the data. This is really worth a look, and I'm going to drop a link to Kerry Ramirez and Dimity Huckle's video where you can watch their latest announcement analysis of the data. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. But they're predicting a drop, decline for next year in terms of students commencing in Australia. That was my big takeaway, but tons of good information in that in that presentation. So very well worth a look. 40 minutes long, best 40 minutes you will spend if you want to be up to date with international education statistics trends heading into 2024. How about you? Any last thoughts for, for the year? Mate, I am hobbling to the finish line at the moment. So I just wanted to say <laughs> thank you to you. If it wasn't for you, we probably wouldn't be doing this. So, mate, I really appreciate everything over the last six months. It's been fantastic. It's been a learning curve for me. And I've even, I hope you don't mind me saying this, I've, I've even got a new microphone under your encouragement. So it's, <laughs> it's been amazing. I really look forward to, to, to the start of next year. But in the meantime, have a, have a wonderful Christmas in, in France and, and have a safe journey home. And, and we look forward to seeing you early next year. And if you're listening to this on the podcast or watching on video, remember all of the latest international education news, thekoalanews.com is the place to go to stay up to date with everything that's breaking in Australian international education. Very grateful to you, Dirk, for all the work that you do for all of us and wishing you all the best as well for the end of 2023. We'll see you in 2024. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Dirk. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.